All right, so hey everyone, welcome to this talk on BTRFS, ButterFS, BetterFS, however you want to pronounce it. Has anyone ever actually heard of this? That's cheating. You guys have heard of it. <laughs> no, I've never used Linux it. Linux magazine. It, it comes with the CentOS. No, I don't know. What's it? Okay. So, first off, who am I? Puyu Puyu. I'm an engineer. I have a couple of funny hats, as he degrees. I have electrical engineering and software engineering. I have a couple of fancy pieces of paper. Uh, uh, certified Ethical Hacker, that's a cool title, uh, Certified Data Recovery Expert, so I know a lot about hard drives, um, this year's AV Director as well as last year, and I've been doing videos for the past couple months, so. <laughs> so first off, what is BTRFS? It's a newer Linux-based file system, and it is awesome. Any questions? <laughs> Seriously though. Why do we need a new file system? Referring to the XKCD, there are 14 competing standards, and soon there are 15 competing standards. Why do we need a new file system? Really, there's three common file systems in use. Linux, ext4, Windows, NTFS, and Mac, HFS+, which is now slowly being upgraded to APFS. So more about all of these in a second. So Linux, ext4, it actually, EXT4 came out in October 2006. It was basically EXT3 with some optimizations and some trim changes. EXT3, November 2001, which is EXT2++. EXT2, January 1993. It's 2017, so we're still using these core operating, this core file system that dates back to 1993. Windows is not much better. Uh, NTFS replaced FAT32 in, on July 1993, and it came with Windows NT 3.1, Windows 2000, and Windows XP. HFS Plus. Any old Mac users here? One. Awesome. Do you remember seeing ever seeing this? This is actually a very hard image to find, and only one person, like one server, actually had that available. So if you look up, uh, if you've tried to look, look for this, where have all my files gone? It's always that one thing. So, HFS Plus goes back to 1998. HFS was 1985. HFS Plus actually uses B star trees, which is slightly different. If you actually upgraded your operating system from, like, I think it was a Mac OS 8 to 8.1 or 7, something like that, you would actually open up your file system and it would say, you have this little image that says, where have all my files gone? And you open it up and it says, this hard disk is formatted with a Mac OS extended format. Your files and information are still on the hard disk, but you cannot access them with the version of software you're using. How can you access these files? To access these files, you must mount this hard disk on a computer that's Mac OS 8.1 or later installed. Oh, and by the way, here's where you can go buy it. <laughs> How convenient. Yeah. Great salesmanship. And that's Apple. So EXT, just remember, uh, reviewing all this, EXT 2, 3, and 4, going back to 1993. HFS Plus, 1985. NTFS, 1993. XFAT, which is a product of Microsoft, 2006. Oh, that's kind of new. APFS, this year. And uh, that was actually something really interesting I looked into. Only on High Sierra, the latest version of Apple OS's, is it actually bootable. So, there's also ZFS going back to 2005 and BTRFS going back to 2009. Hmm? Riser. There is Riser. Yep. Uh, so. There was Riser. Yeah. <laughs> this guy <laughs> you is. About that? This guy is Theodore So, and I'm probably butchering his last name. He's actually the principal editor, or principal author, developer of the EXT uh, 3 and 4 file systems. And he flat out said that BTFRS, BTRFS is a better direction because it offers improvements in scalability, reliability, and ease of management. So even though he was a primary developer of EXT4, he's like, eh, eh. So I've been saying all this. BTRFS. BTRFS, BTRFS, ButterFS, BetterFS, they're all correct. Who all uses this stuff? Facebook. Uh, TripAdvisor, OpenSUSE, uh, Debian, and Ubuntu have this as an option, whatever you install. 
Rockstore is a uh, free NAS like uh, NAS uh, operating system that has BTRFS actually baked into it as opposed to uh, FreeNAS's ZFS. Uh, Netgear's ReadyNAS used those. Red Hat used to, used to, Red Hat Enterprise Linux used to actually offer BTFRS, BTRFS, sorry, as an option, but then they did away with it recently. And they opted to hold out for something called Stratus. So what's Stratus? It's described on Fedora's wiki as a local storage system akin to BTRFS, BTRFS, ZFS, and LVM. Its goal is to enable easier setup and management of disks and SSDs, as well as enabling the use of advanced storage <laughs> features, blah, 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 blah. Provisioning snapshots, new file system, woo. Their roadmap, the first half of 2018, they hope to have version one. And they hope to support snapshot management, file system maintenance, and more. Two, no idea whenever that's coming. They plan to deal with RAID then. Uh, right through caching quotas, version, and version 3, they hope for a rough ZFS parity. It's also developed in Rust and Python. File oh, a file system developed in Python. Interesting. High performance? Uh, Secure? I, I was reading through, I was like, oh, okay, well, let's read about it. It's developed in Python? What? Oh, weird. Okay. So going back to BTRFS, who uses it? Chris Mason is one of the primary developers of BTRFS. He actually currently works for Facebook. And he said, with Facebook, one of the reasons why they like it is it offers data cyclic redundancy checks and metadata CRCs and it actually is able to detect problems in the hardware, such as silent data corruption. Who's all writing this stuff? Oracle actually started developing it at whenever Chris Mason was at Oracle. He then moved to Facebook and is still the primary developer. It is open source, so it, everyone can contribute to it. Facebook uses it, uh, Fujitsu's contributed to it, Intel, the Linux Foundation, Netgear, SUSE, um, like I said, Chris Mason. So all these ask the question, why not ZFS? <laughs> so ZFS is actually is open sourced, but it's not Linux friendly open source. So it's actually CD, CDDL versus GPL. ZFS is also crazy intensive in RAM. Eight gigs of RAM is like the bare minimum. 16 gigs of RAM, 32 gigs, yeah, okay, yeah, you can actually start doing that. So Oracle, remember, Oracle actually developed BTRFS. They actually started developing it before the Oracle Sun acquisition. So some crazy cool features about BTRFS now. We're going to talk about that. <coughs> it's a cow, a copy on write file system. So it's a little different than what you're normally used to. Whenever you write one file and so overwrite it, it'll actually, well, with your traditional NTFS, FAT32, those kind of file systems. Copy on write means every time you make a change, it creates a new file. It creates a new node, or a, a new, yeah, a new, what to call it? I, kind of like an inode, but different. So, um, it also supports file system level compression. And there's three, uh, actually originally there was only two, and then after I written the, wrote and developed these slides, Facebook added a third. So there's Zlib, LZO, and ZSTD. So I actually have some comparisons on file system reads versus overall uh, data usage. So other features, it actually supports subvolumes, supports quotas, and snapshots, which really are just subvolumes with some data in it originally. And you can also make subvolumes read only. Whoever has tried to remove a stubborn file, say, all right, RM this. Nope, you can't do that, all right. Sudo RM this. It just blows it away, right? Unless it's very special. Even with a, a uh, read-only snapshot, root cannot just RM-RF a volume. So, like I was saying, there's, you see at the top here, no file system compression, 
uh, compression in terms of megabytes a second, and decompression speed on the right. LZO versus ZLib versus ZSTD. Remember, ZSTD was actually introduced by Facebook, which was actually written for them by the primary developer of BTRFS. So even just ZSTD1, you can see 260 megabytes a second in terms of compression and 383 uh, megabits a second for decompression at a very, very respectable ratio. Other cool features. You can actually send file system chunks. This is a little different, it's kind of hard to describe. So say you make, you have one file system here, and another file system here. You can actually send the whole file system in a snapshot to this other file system. Okay, cool. Now you have these two. If this was ext, you delete a file here, or you rename a major a, a Windows 7 ISO or something over here. You use rsync. What happens? It sends the whole thing again. Delete a file, and then it actually goes, oh, I'm sorry, you uh, change the name. Deletes all the files over here, re and re-uploads all of them. Eh, kind of sucky. BTRFS, the sub-volume send, will actually send the changes that were made on the file system over here. So rather than send 20 gigabytes of data, it'll only send you know a couple megabytes because all it's doing is just change, uh, sending the changes in the metadata. Changes over here, done. It also does offline conversion from ext3 and ext4 into BTRFS. And it has a couple different storage modes. In single, double, RAID 0, or RAID, uh, RAID 0 one like, RAID 1 like, RAID 5, 6, and 10 like. And it can convert all these RAIDs on the fly without unmounting the file system. You have a live file system. <laughs> Thank you. It's a live file system with changes and reading on it at the same time. And you say, hey, I got another disk. Pop it in. Okay, well, I want to RAID 1. Okay, it's doing it. And you're still reading and writing. That's so cool! So a couple features not yet implemented. There's file encryption, which they currently recommend using dmcrypt with btrfs on top of it, and deduplication, which is a work in progress. So RAID. How many people are here familiar, or not, how many people are not familiar with RAID? Everyone has a gra great grasp on RAID. Not great. Hmm? Not great. Okay, but you understand. It's a redundant array of inexpensive or independent disks. Multiple yeah. disks acting as one. Different levels, different features, different safeties. RAID 0 is not safe at all. RAID 10 is pretty safe. And then hardware and software. You have to go back to the water cooler reference. With RAID 0, Two water coolers. RAID 1, one side by side. 5, you got 3 acting as 1. RAID 0, uh, it's actually RAID 10. Again. So, to kind of explain a little bit better than how I can, how BTRFS handles RAID or RAID like systems, uh, this was one that really just like, oh, okay. And so I wanted to give it credit. So traditional RAID 0, as it says. Oh, uh, it just says, and they're talking about rating their dressers for their underpants, right? So traditional RAID 0. Hey, I'll just stripe across all the disks. Traditional RAID, boring, mirror identical drives, yay. Woo, very, very boring. And the each of these drives have to be two terabytes each. You get double the read IO. You do. So traditional RAID 5. Pros, storage efficiency. Cons, everything else. Slower to read, slower to write, and you, get, you do get one drive tolerance. Again, two terabyte, two terabyte, two terabyte. 
traditional. Come on, there he goes. Traditional rate six, guaranteed two drive, uh, failure survive. Cons, again everything else where you have, uh, you know, uh, four or more drives acting as n minus two. Again. Very boring. You have two cross of two terabyte drives. Rate 10. Rate plus rate is more rate. So BTRFS RAID 1. You have a bunch of drives. RAID 4, or 4 terabyte, 3 terabyte, and 2 terabyte. So as you see, it's not exactly RAID, it's RAID-like. Where RAID RAID 1, the big thing is you at least have one other copy of it. So you can kind of visualize, hey, okay, that's kind of cool. But what happens whenever you get another two terabyte drive? You plug it in, you add it to there, and it actually will start filling up this other drive in line with all the others. So if you lose that two terabyte drive, will you lose the whole file system? Mm, if you lose a two terabyte, well, in that example, in this example, there's a lot. Well, if like you lost, uh, like this one, you mean? Well, frankly, what I'm saying is any of them. It looks like it's not literally copying every drive. It is every file that is written, every block that is written, is at least written on one other drive. So you could have that four terabyte drive go away, and you still have. Uh, any you know, any one drive failure redundancy. In a traditional RAID 1, you could have four drives. They would just all have the same data. Right. And so you could use three drives. Uh, right. But the big thing is, in a traditional RAID 1, all right, now I have another drive. Can I just plug it in and bam, everything's all no, back you, to the... You'd have to reboot, bro. Exactly. You would have to re... Uh, I think and then re silver balance. Re yeah. Exactly. How robust is that Falcon that, that, that file system well with compression and recovering from problems? I remember back, I guess it was early 90s, that, that there was a, a fad for a time of on the fly compression. But if you had a power glitch or a software problem, you'd lose the into you, you basically lost the entire contents of the file system. So, how BTRFS does the thing with a copy and write. Uh, structure. Every time it creates a new or modifies a file, it creates a tree or it creates a branch of the tree. If you have a power failure, if your entire file system goes hey, kaput, you can actually go back and there are multiple copies of all these metadata and all these trees that you can actually go back then and say, all right, I can look back at this right from this tree. Okay, well, Actually, I see another generation down here. I see another generation. I see a later generation. And so you can actually recover multiple generations from a file system. So is it a versioning file system? Where it retains all versions of every edit if you tell it to until it runs out of space and starts to leave all stuff? Yes. Hmm? Can you repeat what he said? It is kind of like a versioning file system where every time you write a file, it will create that version in the free, in the overall space. And then whenever you run out of space, it will actually start uh, overwriting the unread, or the uh, unused areas. So storage levels. Single, there's a couple different storage levels that you can tell it to go into. Single, where it's just one copy of data. Dupe, duplicate. Uh, just two copies of the same data, but it can just be on the same drive. RAID 1, again, is just two copies of data across different drives. RAID 0, one copy across different, uh, different drives. RAID 10, where so on and so forth. RAID 5, which is two, two chunks of data, one chunk of parity, just written across and just uh, distributed. Same for RAID 6. So, as you can see, traditional RAID 1 is not BTRFS RAID 1. You can also have, well, as I've shown, arbitrary sizes of hard drives. That is so cool! 
MD ADM will say, oh, what's your lowest common denominator? Okay, well, uh, that's, your, that's what you got. Sorry. Uh, so if you go to carfax.org.uk slash BTRFS dash usage, I know it's like, what? Carfax? Uh, they actually have, <laughs> show me the Carfax. Uh, yeah, they actually have a calculator on there. You can say, I want to add five disks with these arrangements and this kind of uh, data structure of RAID, uh, RAID 5, and it will actually kind of visually show you where all the data lies at. Did I read it right? I don't have to partition your drive anymore. Yes, you do not. Yes, it is his own, or no, it is yes. <laughs> Are there any other people in this house? Uh, you do not need to partition your drives. You can, BTRFS will actually use the entire the whole block device. The whole block, yes. The problem whenever you are uh, installing, though, is you typically have <coughs> the first 512 me uh, bytes be your master boot, I'm sorry, the first 446 bytes be your master boot record, followed by the uh, partitioning information. So your primary boot device probably would need to be partitioned. But if you have, you can have like dev SDA1, dev SDA2, SD3, whatever. But then you just have dev SDB, SDC, SDD. And it can actually use the entire uh, information, the entire, entire space. I mean, it's puppeting it a lot easier because partitioning is your puppet. I highly recommend still partitioning your drives because when the kernel boots up, it'll look at that block device and try to read partition information. It'll get a bunch of erroneous, like, doesn't make any sense, like, can't read partition data from SDA, out a bit. SDA. Like, it's fine, it still boots and everything, but when you do go and lose a drive, that's frightening to see. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. So it's, it's a good practice to still do, but you don't need to. It, yeah. Uh, fun little fact. A RAID 5 in BTRFS can be done with two drives. Yeah, and it's like, huh? Where they basically said that one drive contains all the data, one drive contains all the parity. Uh, I don't know. There's a second drive that can be twice I To me, it's like, wait, RAID 5 with two drives, so it's essentially a malformed RAID 1, but it works? It's the function. opposite of the, the main drive? <laughs> Wait, it's a one on the main drive, it's a zero on the parent drive? <laughs> I, I don't know what you're going to And if you set them on top of each other, they explode? <laughs> it's like geotech math? Anyway, so, yeah. <laughs> another different way to think about it is, is say you have two one terabyte drives and then two 500 gig drives. MDADM, of course, would say, oh, 500 gigs, that's what you got. However, traditional RAID is not this kind of RAID. It is the, think about it that multiple smaller drives can stack together with this kind of little visualization, that the two, ter two, two terabyte drives roughly equal about a four terabyte. So here, a RAID 5 would actually uh, yield a eight terabyte storage volume. So I mentioned you can swap between the two different, or swap between everything. If you do the BTRFS balance start mount point, it'll actually balance everything out, make everything nice and pretty, where instead of all the data being on one drive and some uh, scatter the rest on the other, like the example before, it'll actually balance, shuffle everything out, so it's all nice and balanced. Kind of like defragging. Kind of like defragging, but there is also a defrag command, <coughs> which is different. Yeah. You have to defrag B trees? Well, by nature, it's copy and write. So that's one of the major drawbacks is it is very hard drive thrashing. It's very fragmented. Uh, but to convert between different raids levels, you would say you know, balance start dash D for data, convert equals raid one dash M for metadata, convert RAID 1, your mount point, and it'll chug, 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 and it'll get it done. But the other really, really cool thing is, is say you have a, uh, an eight terabyte 
RAID, uh, old style, with using the MD80 or something. All right. You put a new drive in, one drive fails, you put a new drive in, all right, let it go, but you only used 500 megabytes. You know, it's brand new. What is it going to have to do, traditionally, with MD80? It will go, re, re, re silver the entire eight terabytes. Even though, hmm? I'm sorry. You'll be, your, your state will be degraded. Yeah. And so it just sits there. And, but it'll, the big thing is, it'll have to read and write eight terabytes across all your drives. So you're sitting there like, oh, come on. With BTRFS, it only copies and balances out the used portions. So if you only have 500 gig used on an eight terabyte array, it'll only copy and shuffle around 500 gigs. So I mentioned this a couple times, the metadata. So what exactly is in this metadata? So every chunk of your data, of the actual data data, is checksumed and stored, and is stored. And upon every time you read it back, it'll actually do a checksum again on that data and compare it with the metadata that has a checksum. So this way, if something were to happen to your data and uh, like your hard drive is failing, it'll say, uh, hey, this section doesn't match this. Do you have a bad problem? If this were in, an, in a RAID, it'll say, whoa, this doesn't match. Let me try the other. Hey, this checks on matches. All right, I'm going to go ahead and return this. And in the meantime, I'm going to re rewrite the bad sector, the bad stuff. So it'll actually do all this stuff in the background. Come on, that is so cool. So snapshots and subvolumes. Again, it's kind of like a mounted partition, but it's not. So it's accessible like a directory, but the subvolume itself can be on a completely different disk. It can be made read-only, and even if you do, like I said, if you do the sudo rmrf, the path to the old, uh, path to the read-only snapshot, it says you do not have permissions to do this operation. So if you don't know what you're doing with BTRFS, you're like, but I'm I did this. I did this root. Why don't I have permissions? What is this? Windows? Yes, you might. <laughs> 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 <Yes. laughs> so, if you can actually also do a snapshot, yes, Brent Sound. You 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 can make snapshots read only. Can you then make them rewritable again? Or yes. Like a one yes. Uh, you can actually uh, through a changing of the uh, uh, changing a tag on the on the actual sub volume to say this is now re uh, read write done. Yes. Uh, for e discovery, have they been using legal pages yet? I am not aware of any. Uh, but one of the other really stupid cool things about snapshots is it can happen in seconds. So you can snapshot a 500 gig hard drive, hard drive, not a snap, not a solid state. Say, all right, I want to take this, do a snapshot. <laughs> Okay, cool. And you can still access it. You can still access it like it's just a mother mounted directory. Because all it is doing, instead of copying all the data, it is just copying all the metadata, copying all the directory structures, copying all of, and just storing all that, which is already written. And saying, oh, there it is. Now whenever you do a copy on write, it'll go around. Do you know if any distros uh, make snapshots every boot for like a, Feature. I'm not aware of any. Events? I'm not aware of any uh, OSs that do it out of the gate. Uh, was it Scent? I think Scent and uh, no, not Scent. That's that's Red Hat Fedora. Uh, but Susie is actually one of the major supporters of BTRFS, and they actually, by default, support uh, their default o uh, file system is BTRFS. Um, but it's Linux. Do a cron job, do it on boot. You know, make a new snapshot. Uh, Chris, I think it was Chris Mason or one of the other developers. He actually has scripts that run uh, like about every hour. They just make a new snapshot, make a new snapshot, make a new snapshot. Oh, it's, hey, it's full. All right, delete the oldest one, and just goes on for hours, every hour on the hour. Because why not? Well, your point time recovery. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I didn't know I mean to delete that file. Okay, well, go back. So. And there's hardly any 
additional drive usage because, again, this is all written to the drive itself. It's already written. All you're doing is saying, all right, here, cap it here. And just due to the nature of the copy on write. So sending and receiving, like I had mentioned, you have the two file systems. You can say, you can actually pipe this through, it's designed to run at the standard input. So you can pipe it through SSH. You can pipe it through, uh, yeah, the example I use here, I say, uh, uh, a one CD ISO. You are sync it over to a backup location, you change the file name, and then it'll actually delete the CD.ISO, and then we'll have to rename it to the Debian net installation ISO. But again, with BTRFS, it'll say, wait, you just changed this, okay? Done. Bam! Cool! Offsite backups. Stupid easy. So, D for downsides. I've been playing this is so cool. Downsides, like I said. Copy and write, fragmentation. Oh, fragmentation. There is a manual defragment, which is different than a balance. Uh, and trees can become unbalanced, so you have to rebalance occasionally. Virtual machines with a copy and write file system, terrible. So they unfortunately, the best thing to do is actually disable these copy and write uh, by using the, uh, the chatter, C-H-A-T-T-R, plus C, which says, all right, on the file system, disable copy on write for this directory. And it can only be happened on new directories. So even though you have my virtual box, my VMs, you say, all right, this is now cop non copy on write. Okay, it'll say that, but it won't make that for the old, uh, old things. So you would actually have to create a new directory, say, this is not copy on write, copy all the files over, not move them, delete the old directory, rename it. To paraphrase, you're saying that the, the host machine that's hosted. Yes, I'm sorry. This was all on the host machine. Oh, because the VMDKs change a lot. Exactly. So, yes, the VMDKs, virtual disks, they change. They do a lot of writing just by nature. Does, For, does that mean you lose out on like snapshot features and stuff in that directory? I am honestly not sure. And the only time I've ever used the non-copy on write with that was inside of VMs, but then it's like, all right, well, VirtualBox has snapshot features. I mean, it has its own features built into that. Data perf database performance, if you go to the uh, Phoronix uh, website where they benchmark things daily, uh, nine times out of 10, database performance is terrible on BTRFS. So don't use it for databases. Uh, check some up because it's doing this checksum for every single read and write. It's awesome for data integrity, but you got a data performance in. A lot of times, if your devices get to about 95% usage, a lot of times metadata takes up your metadata takes up space too. You can get unbalanced trees, and they'll say your device is full, but you're like, I still have 10 gig. What's going on? That's another unfortunate downside. DF-H, show me what's free. Isn't exactly true. It's kind of like, what, it's just free space. But you're looking at different things. You're looking at snapshots. You're looking at compression going on. And every time that uh, BTRFS will say, this is my chunk of data. I'm going to write to it, write to it, write to it, write to it. Oh, I'm running out. OK, chuck another chunk. DF will say, this much is used, but the actual internal BTRFS systems will say, oh, it's actually only about this much. Will, will trees become unbalanced just under normal usage? Like, I understand when you add a drive, they'll become unbalanced, mm -hmm. but just like day to day. If you do major data, meta, ma major data modifications, so like if you have a ISO of a hard drive, uh, or you know, a DD ISO of a hard drive that's 10, 10 terabytes on a, uh, say, a 12 terabyte array. All right, you leave that 10 terabytes, boom. yes, it's going to get heavily uh, unbalanced. But if you're doing the delete a little file here, delete a little file here, write a little file, day-to-day -day operations, probably not. Is it a good idea, bad idea to just have like a synchron tab that does the defrag and the rebalancing? Not a bad idea at all. Or so? um, it can take a while because it is reading every single chunk of data and sort and kind of rearranging it and trying to balance it across all your drives. 
So it will take a long time, the more data you have. But again, all of these are downsides, but at the same time you are getting checksum data integrity. The other downsides, RAID 5.6. Has anyone ever heard of what's called the write hole? It was actually described earlier on. You're in a RAID, going, 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 power outage. Poof! Some of the RAID, uh, some of the data actually was not written to the hard drives. This problem is still happening. It's still there with BTRFS. To be fair, MD RAID has the exact same problem. So if you're using MD RAID, no, you're not in any different boat if you use BTRFS. So the scrub data, the uh, scrub operation. Oh boy. So in July 2016, there was a condition that was found that would restore bad data. What the scrub does is it will actually go through every single block of data and do its checksum and compare it to the metadata. And that's what a lot of people say needs to happen just monthly, just as a cron job. Just go through and make sure everything's good. If there's bad problems, uh, restore it if it's in a raid. There, and there was a issue that it would actually, it's very, I still don't quite fully understand it, but it will actually take the metadata and say, wait a minute, this is the wrong drive, or it was look at the, uh, the parity metadata, it would mess that up, and be due to a race condition in the actual file system, and it would restore invalid data. So your scrub operation, which is intended to verify all your data, is actually mangling your data. So uh, that actually was uh, that was found in July. There was a patch submitted in November. However, if you're using kernel 4.13, uh, uh, back that was actually pushed in July 2017, that fix is actually in there. So, uh, and if you go to kernel.org, they are patchwork kernel org patch blah 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 blah. They actually say RAID 0 and 1 and 10, they're considered mature. They, are, they, fir they firmly say, go forth, do great things. RAID 5, 6 are still, uh, right, uh, still described as heavily under maintenance and development and experimental. Does the scrub operation only apply to RAID 5 and 6? Or no. Also you, can do a RAID, uh, you can do a RAID 1, RAID 0, you can do a single drive duplicate uh, with duplicate data. Uh, just with a scrub operation in a like a single data storage configuration, it will just say you have bad data. It wouldn't be able to recover on the it would say, oh, okay, you have bad data, and I saved it. Go me. So, conclusions about this whole thing: BTRFS is stable in the single, the double, RAID zero, one, and ten. RAID five six does have some underlying bugs, so. Uh, file system compression is awesome. Uh, I actually did a talk last uh, last Freaknik on uh, Diceware, and I would create a word list. If you actually did ls-lah for that one word list, it was gigabytes. I think actually it was like a like maybe using a terabyte but it was only using up like one gig of my hard drive space because it was, it's all words. It's all just ASCII data. Compresses, compresses down, crazy awesome. Snapshots, so cool. Have you ever been somewhere and say, hey, hold on, let me make a quick snapshot of my entire file system while you're using it. And then say, all right, yeah, here we go. Knock yourself out. They erase the entire uh, root directory. Oh, okay, well. My uh, snapshot's still there. Okay, boot into recovery media, do some tricks, get it all back. You're back up and running. I've actually done that with. Uh, I was trying to install some graphic drivers on my old laptop. I said uh, I'm about to do something that might mangle this. Okay, do a snapshot. Two or three seconds later. All right, app install this. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. Five minutes later. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. <laughs> So I was able to boot into a, uh, a USB environment, just do an rsync uh, delete, or rsync dash dash delete. Uh, I think I excluded uh, dev, proc, and sys, and temp, and just from the, from the mount, the snapshot, into the, uh, 
the, for the I guess the root file system. All right, did its thing. It rebooted like nothing happened. So you guys have been asking a ton of a ton of questions Sorry. during this. Hmm? Sorry, about that. no, no, no. That's awesome. That's great. It's I've spent hours looking at this thing like what? RAID 5 only needs two drives technically to operate? What? Uh, let's see, I got 15 minutes. So hopefully, we actually can. Can you give us a demo of how to your Windows? Well, so. Yeah. I'm not probably a I used to run web servers that did a lot of bandwidth. Uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, and uh, if I did MD admin with like a RAID 5 or RAID 0, the, you would, the CPU of that process alone would be detrimental to the web server. Mm -hmm. uh, would it, do, you, do you have metrics on what like other assets is like doing that? I know RAID 5 sounds like it. Those would happen, very balance would happen in a single thread, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, they, they're both doing math to figure out what they're doing. Right, right. There, yeah, so the, the BTRFS calculations, yes, they are done on the CPU. There is a bit of a CPU hit, uh, hit on that. However, again, I mean, this laptop is uh, 2.5 gigahertz. What was your speed on that? This was a decade ago. Right, a decade, and you're talking megahertz. So it's like, oh, okay, well, you know. Well, we'd be talking gigahertz. Oh, not many. Not, not, not. Oh, yeah, that's true. Two of them. Little giant. So did I'm gonna try to be. I just see a two. They just were, you know, multi-core. Multi right. Yeah. right. Ah. So I think it would be ideal if the rebalancing and the other operations were able to have one happen in multiple threads because that would address that particular problem, right? We have many cores mm -hmm. and CPUs and that's new. Yeah, maybe that would help a lot. Yeah, it's a good question. Well, then the other thing is. is your and then again, if you're running a web server, you probably have the hell's problem. You just ran Linux on your laptop. <laughs> well, so, so prior to this, I was like, all right, I need to try to figure this out. I need to get a demo, demo ready. I had VirtualBox ready to go. And then I uh, created a new, I took like actually a USB device, plugged it in, said, all right, let it do its thing. Great, cool. The problem was, I didn't let it fully balance, and then I deleted the sub volume from inside of my thing. What I did, what I thought I was doing, was saying, "All right, this is my sub volume. I'm going to make a RAID one of this sub volume." What it was actually doing was making, uh, trying to make a RAID one from an, uh, my underlying file system, which was 500 gigs, to this you know 880 gigabyte external hard drive. So it's like, "Oh, this is taking so long." Well, all right, I just blow it away. <laughs> what I didn't realize doing that heavily mangled it. And so until I came in here and uh, plugged into HDMI, like, huh, why can't I get video going? Let me let me try the uh, old Windows method of rebooting. And, oh, I uh, can't boot. So. Uh, so you the disk the second thing down Windows? Sorry? Yeah. <laughs> When you got five minutes, you uh, make do with what you got. Exactly. <laughs> All right, so here it is. 80 gigs, sure. You got to plug your ISO in on the top there. Yep. All right, go. Yep, downloads, because I'm going off a uh, system rescue CD. So you are you going to install other apps? So I like to do. A lot of stuff with this. Uh, my rescue, my choice rescue <laughs> system is System Rescue CD, which has BTRFS built into it. Yeah. Yeah, it's not mounted with CD. It's it's all over. It's it's just mounted. Yeah, ISO. Yeah. yeah. So we see we have SDA, SDB, 10 gig, 80 gig, all right? So we say BTRFS, well, 
following brimstones. New. Actually, uh, it'll probably blow away uh, on uh, so make directory uh, btrfs uh, sdb one oh not make directory make file system Durr. all right so now I have an 80 gig uh, file system you say you have data is in I don't have most. Data is in a single, metadata is in a duplicate, system data is in a duplicate. It doesn't recognize it as an SSD. Cool. So now we say in make directory, this is my mount point. Mount dash O, uh, compress dev SDB1, this is my mount point. Cool. megabytes. Now I mounted this with file system compression. So do btrfs file system usage root this is my file system or this is my mount point used 6.32 netty bits. Six megabytes compressed or 273 value Grant, it's nothing there. Compressed down to six megabytes. That's so cool. You need the ISO over. Hmm? You need the ISO over. Like SR zero or whatever that is. Yeah. Uh, so, it, so other cool, neat little thing about with a file system built into it, it'll actually start compressing the first little bit. If it's a already compressed image or if it's a binary or something where it's not very compressible, it'll say, uh, this really isn't worth it and kind of blow it away. But it's Linux, so you can say compress always and do it. Uh, but I was going to show you, so we say nice pretty tab completes. I'm going to say btrfs device add dev sda one <laughs> two this <laughs> Bam, and just like that. Usage. We see here at the bottom, unallocated. Ten gigabytes of SDA one and uh, only or in 76 gigabytes on unallocated, which is, again, BTRFS will say, all right, this is all we have available. I'm going to take this little chunk, which is what you see uh, up top where it says data single size is one gigabyte. It's already, it's already claimed one gigabyte, but it's only using nine megabytes of it. So then this data... It did, that, it did a grade zero by default, basically? With this, it actually does a single. So you can actually put, okay. think of it as a, uh, uh, just a bunch of disks. So it's not quite, rate, it's not rate zero, but it's that example where it's like, all right, we have this and just fill it up and kind of balance things out a little bit. But, uh, let's see, it's what, file system, balance, start, deconvert, Raid 10. Uh, no, can't do that. Raid 1. Shim convert. Equals raid 1. Uh, 
done. I just converted on the fly while the file system was mounted on this on these virtual drives from a uh, from a single storage to now you see data RAID one size two gigabytes use nine megabytes. So Can you free up anything off of SPP? Mm, it did not free anything up because with RAID one. Uh, you just want everything oh, yeah. on one drive to be written to at least one other drive. <laughs> we can go to read zero. Oh, no. it's all right. Is there any, any reason why you would want to try to put metadata not the same RAID level as your data? I saw single and double earlier. Single. Uh oh. Oh no. Okay, I think I just lost the projector. Maybe it's that's not unplugged. Uh, that was, that's not yeah, unplugged. If you just reformat it, the projectors are okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. It's a snapshot. It is. <laughs> well, there's yeah, one on the other side. All right. Best laid plans. I think this is a sign that says that this talk is just about yeah. over. But before I hit the program, uh, hit enter, yes, it just hits. You can say convert the data to a RAID 0, convert it to a RAID 1. You can have uh, your metadata in a duplicate format which means it's stored at least one other place. It could be on the same hard drive, it could be somewhere else. You could store the metadata in RAID 1. You could store the metadata in RAID 10 if you want, while well, the data itself is only stored in uh, just single format. So it's kind of a good principle, though, to if your data is RAID 1, you want your metadata to be RAID 1. But uh, with a single disk setup, a lot of times your data will be in single and your uh, trees will be in a uh, duplicate. Just that way, if something were to happen to your file system or your hard drive, or you get a bad sector here that affects the uh, B trees, yeah, the uh, B trees, you at least have a duplicate of all your metadata that you can recover from. So, on that note, any other questions? Nope. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you.